If you have your Bibles, we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Good evening. It's good to be back with you again tonight. Uh, like I said, I would like to welcome you here to our, our worship service here at Northwest uh, tonight. Most of you know that uh, this past weekend I spent uh, the better part of this past weekend in Louisville, Texas. Uh, they invited me to uh, go down there for a uh, annual lectureship that they have for high school uh, aged children. Uh, it's called T3, and T3 stands for Teach the Truth. Uh, there's a similar workshop that's been taking place in Moore, Oklahoma, and we went to that one last year as a congregation. Um, I, I, I've been privileged to go and speak there in Louisville the last couple of years, and I've really enjoyed it. I shared with our young adult class this morning a bit of what I consider to be encouraging news that I wanted to share with you. It seems that oftentimes whenever we think of um, young people within the church, most of the time it's typically spoken of in a negative context. We talk about how many are leaving the church, and we talk about depressing uh, statistics. And while that's, that's merited from time to time, I think it's good to also shed a little light on things that are good that are going on. Uh, last year for that workshop as I went down there, uh, that they had about 380 uh, high, school, uh, high school kids that went down for the weekend. And if you would see the schedule, all they did all day long is sit in Bible class after Bible class after Bible class. So some might think, okay, well, you tricked 380 kids to go there for a weekend and just listen to the Bible. What were the numbers like this year? There were well over 670 uh, that were there this year. So it was a wonderful work, and I just thought that it would be encouraging for you to know that as well. Uh, one of the topics that I was assigned whenever I was speaking there is what you see in front of you. How, how can I show Jesus to the world? And that was the topic, the question that was presented to me. And I, I wanted to share just a few of those thoughts uh, with you this evening. How can you and I, how can we effectively show Jesus to the world that we live in? Most of you that are uh, parents, you can probably relate to me in this, in this way. I find that my faith in Jesus... My faith in God, my faith in the Bible as God's Word, becomes more important to me each and every day as a father, more than I ever thought that it could be before I became a father. And one of the main reasons for that is I look at the world around us, and if I was to ask you to summarize our, our world, to, to uh, put it into one word, how would you describe it, corrupt or pure? If those are your two choices, which one would you go with? I would think probably the majority of us would say we live in a corrupt world. It's not even close. We can find elements of purity. We can find elements uh, of positive things that we would like to encourage and say, lift up and say, look what good I found. But as a whole, we live in a corrupt world. And so as a father, what I ask myself is what can I do for my children? What can I do as a, as a father to raise my children? In essence, really what this boils down to is how can my children be different from the world? We live in a corrupt world, and Jesus, as we know, is perfect and pure. How can my children, how can I, how can you, how can we show Jesus to the world? The real question that that's asking is how can we stand out? How can we be different? I love the text that David Sexton read for us for our scripture reading there from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we're looking at that, that scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I love verse 14 where uh, Paul, he says, For the love of Christ controls us. What a great statement, powerful statement. I want us to start, number one, tonight. How can we show Jesus to the world? I'd say it's very simply this. We, we must talk about Jesus. I want you to think for just a minute about the things in life that you're passionate about. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's school. Maybe it's not school. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your hobbies. Whatever it is, I want you to think about those things that aren't necessarily church-related, but things that you enjoy in your everyday life, the things that you're passionate about. I want you to ask another question to yourself. Do your close friends and family, do they know that you're passionate about those things? 
I'm going to take and go out on a limb and say that they do. They know that you're passionate about them. One of the big reasons is because you talk about it. Because they, they see you spending so much time with it. They, they hear how much time you spend talking about your passion. Any of you know any Dallas Cowboy fans? Maybe not as many after this past season. But if you think about the Dallas Cowboy fans, you typically know who they are because they're talking about Jerry Jones ruining their Cowboys. You can go on down the line and think about those things that really get us passionate in our life. We talk about them all the time. Let me ask you just real seriously tonight. How much time do we spend talking about Jesus? Not necessarily just talking about going to church, but talking about Jesus. Talking about what he means for me, what he means to me in my life. What it means to me to have a savior. What it means for me to have faith and hope that there's going to be something better waiting for me. Do I talk about that very often? I'd encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 will begin in, in verse 33. There are many today that don't view words as something that has a lot of importance. Well, actions speak louder than words, and that statement's true. But I think it's important that we don't overlook or neglect the power in our words. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 33, Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Based on this text alone, I would hope that you would agree that words are powerful and words are important. I want to look at just a few things that we can gain from this one text. As Jesus is talking about our words, first he begins with the comparison about the fruit. That a tree is known by its fruit. And then he immediately begins talking about the words. That our words are part of that fruit. I want you to really focus on verse 34. Where Jesus said, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Listen to this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want you to underline that in your Bible if you like to underline. I want you to underline that, that phrase. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paraphrasing that, what Jesus says is you talk about what's in your heart. You talk about what you care about. I'll challenge you as I challenge myself with this question. When I find myself passing up an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, just to invite someone to church, to open uh, my mouth when there, I see there might be a door of opportunity, but maybe I let it slide. And I say, why did I let that go? Jesus says you talk about what's in your heart. Maybe, just maybe. I haven't given Christ the throne room seat in my heart like I know that I should. Then we find here at the end, verse 36 and 37, where Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word. Some of your translations will say an idle word that they speak. For by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. Powerful stuff. Jesus says your words will make you right. Your words will condemn you. Your words are powerful. Words can influence people in a great way and also in a negative way. I'll share one illustration with you about my father. Uh, most of you know that my dad is uh, as a carpenter. It was in carpentry. Uh, I'll never forget my first day walking on a, an apartment complex that I'd never been on before. It was my dad's first day uh, in Seminole, Oklahoma. And as we got there, I got the wonderful job of sweeping the floors because I was a young guy and that's my job. And as I'm sweeping all of the floors towards the end of our work day, I begin to hear a lot of shouting out one of the windows. And whenever I look out the window, I see two very large men that were saying a lot of words that we would never want to repeat. And they were about to come to blows, about to start throwing punches at one another. Not a real pleasant sight. And I see my dad walk up to these two men. I couldn't hear what he said. He wasn't screaming like they were. And he began to separate them. And being the brave son that I was, I put my head down, kept sweeping the floor. Well, then all of a sudden, the, the boss, the foreman for this, this crew that had the two men that were fighting, he walks in behind me. Again, I don't know this man. He just knew that my dad was my dad. And he said, let me ask you a question. And I said, what's that? He said, where do you go to church? I want you to really pay attention to that question. He didn't say, do you go to church? He said, where do you go to church? 
I remember as, as a young teenage boy, that was the first time that I looked at my dad and I felt like the roles were reversed. Normally, it's fathers bragging on their children. This was the opposite. I felt so proud of my dad because the way that he handled the situation with his words, they were so drastically different than what anyone else around was doing. And this man knew there had to be something different about him. I encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. As you see, we, we can see good examples of how our words can be used to show Jesus to the world, to stand out. But we also have some biblical examples of some negative ways that our words can be used. Matthew chapter 26, beginning verse 73. This is picking up right in the middle of Peter denying Jesus. We know the story well that Jesus was speaking with his disciples and says, One of you will deny me. And Peter said, Not me, Lord. And Jesus said, Yes, you, Peter. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And then we find Peter as he sees what's happening to our Lord and Savior as he's being led away on that trial. Maybe Peter's faith was a little shaken by what he saw with his eyes. And he was asked, aren't you with Jesus? No, I'm not with Jesus. He was asked again, I recognize you. I, I know I've seen you with him. No, I'm not with Jesus. And we pick up here in verse 73 on the third and final denial of Peter. Let's listen carefully to this. It says, After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Verse 74, Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. I want you to pay real close attention to verse 74 and ask yourself, You see, Peter's already said, I don't know who Jesus is, twice. What did he do the third time to distance himself from Jesus? He began to invoke a curse, he began to curse, he began to swear. We don't have any account of anyone else questioning Peter's relationship with Jesus following that. Maybe they did, and we just don't need to know about it. But we don't have an account of anyone else trying to link Peter with Jesus. But I believe that right there, he began to successfully distance himself from Christ. But I often wonder how often I am guilty, and maybe you, of distancing ourselves from Jesus, at least in the minds of other people, because of the way that we talk. I say, well, I know that Troy goes to church, but I also hear the way he talks to his wife. I know that Troy goes to church, but he doesn't ever talk about it. I know that Troy goes to church, but I'm his friend on Facebook, and I see what he posts. Yes, Facebook counts as our words, right? Those are still our thoughts. Whenever right, we think about how we can show Jesus to the world, I would start very simply with that. We must talk about him. Number two, in order for you and I to show Jesus to the world, we need to live a pure life. I'd encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. As we mentioned before, if we were to categorize our world into one of two words of corrupt or pure, most of us would say it was corrupt without, with no contest. Maybe you've seen the illustrations before where you, you shut all the doors, you close all the windows, you, you tape off any, any light surface, and you begin to see how dark it can get in a room, and then someone lights a candle. And you see just how much light can come from that one single flame. I'm sure you've seen that before. I want us to, to look at this uh, special text that many of us have heard hundreds, if not thousands of times. Jesus, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Most of the time, whenever we look at this text... What we pull out of it is we need to be lights in the world. And what a great message that is. We sing the song at Vacation Bible School, This Little Light of Mine. My daughter loves that. We sing it all the time. Whenever we think about that song and the powerful words, a powerful meaning that our children sing, I also think there's another message right following that in verse 14. Jesus says, you're the light of the world, but notice the second part. He says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say that it's hard to hide a city that's set on a hill? He says it can't be done. I want you to ask your, yourself a question as we're questioning ourselves and asking, our, am I doing a good job of bringing Jesus to the world? A answer this question. Do you ever hide the fact you're a Christian? Because Jesus says you can't. You see, someone who is a true disciple of his cannot hide. 
They're like a city that's set on a hill. Everybody automatically knows that there's something different about them. And you say, why are you talking about that when you said live a pure life? I want to guarantee you uh, tonight, I don't want to do that often. I want to guarantee you tonight that if you and I would commit our lives, commit ourselves to being pure in every facet of our life, you will be that city set on a hill. In the world that we live in today, purity is so foreign that it stands out in every walk of life. You want to stand out? You want to show the world Jesus? Commit yourself to being pure. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 if you have your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3. I'm asked quite frequently, what is my favorite passage of Scripture? What's my favorite verse in the Bible? I don't know that I have one. Uh, most of you are probably the same. It depends on the day as to what I like to reflect upon, what I'm going through in my life. But I always find myself coming back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing here to the church of Philippi, he says, Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our, uh, us as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? It talks about our citizenship is in heaven. I want you to think about what that word citizenship means. It means that's where you belong. That's your home. That's where you have certain rights, certain privileges. That is where you're from. I don't know how many of you spend any time out of the country. I don't do that often. But I spent a little bit of time in Haiti whenever we went on a mission trip in college. And one of the scariest moments of my life happened whenever I got off the plane in Haiti. For those of you that maybe have never been there, don't know much about Haiti, let's just say they're not as efficient as we are here in the U.S. Uh, they're the definition of a third world country. They didn't have everything all computerized in their airports uh, like we do here. As we stepped off of our, of our plane, which was a 15-passenger plane that had 18 people and six chickens on it, if that tells you anything about the culture, as we began stepping off of that plane, we were each handed a, a green piece of paper that was about this long and about that wide, very small piece of paper with a bunch of numbers on it. And as we were handed that paper, we were told, don't lose this or you can't come home. Whoa, this piece of paper is what's going to get me home? Yes. You can't leave this country if you don't have that piece of paper. And so I would find myself, along with everyone else in our college group, uh, just forgetting about life back here and being focused on what we were doing there, having a great time, and then have a little mini heart attack. Where's that green piece of paper? Okay, there it is. I can still have fun. I can still enjoy myself because I can still go home. That green piece of paper always represented that we belonged somewhere else. We were there temporarily. We were doing some work, but we were going to go home. The same for us today. We're here doing some mission work today. We're going to go home eventually. This is not our home. We're only here for a little while. But the real question is, do we live like that? Do we live like this is our home or like heaven is our home? Whenever you think about Enoch, Enoch is one of two men that we have recorded in the Bible that did not die. That God brought up to heaven before his death. We don't know much about Enoch. We know who his father was, we know who his children were, and we know that he walked with God. That's all we know about him. What a great legacy. But as we look at this legacy that was left of a man that just walked with God, it's amazing to me to think of what that must have been like for him to leave this earth without perishing physically. Uh, Dan Winkler, I once heard him in a lectureship who was speaking over Enoch, and he had this to say. He said, God was walking with Enoch day by day until finally God looked at Enoch and said, Enoch, you're a lot closer to my home than you are yours. Why don't you come home with me? Of course, you won't find that in your Bible, but I like to think of it that way. I like to think of it that way and ask that question about myself. Do I live closer to earth or closer to heaven? Where's our home? If we're living a pure life, that's someone who's living a life like they don't belong here. I encourage you to turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and while you're turning there, I was going to remind some of you, I know I've shared this with a few before, probably the best sermon illustration I've ever heard in my life was there in Haiti. I went to the school of preaching, and there was a preacher who was giving, um, who was giving a lesson to uh, the other uh, preaching students. And for those of you who maybe haven't been there, uh, drinking water, purified water, is very hard to come by in that country. Indoor plumbing is rare as raw sewage floods the streets. Well, this preacher, he, he held up a glass of, uh, of purified drinking water, and he said, how many of you would like to take a drink of this? Well, every hand went up. I want some of that water. 
And then he bent down and he got a little bit of that raw sewage in his glass. He said, now how many of you want to take a drink? Oddly enough, nobody wanted any anymore. They all lost their thirst. And he made the point that just a little bit of pollution ruins the whole glass. And how foolish we are oftentimes when we think, as long as I'm mostly pure spiritually, that will be acceptable to God. And we forget that just a little bit of impurity ruins the whole person. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3 paints us a, a, a portrait, a picture of God. It says, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. He's, he's defined here as a, as a refiner and a purifier of silver. I don't know how many of you know much about that process of purifying silver. I know I've never done it, but I've read about people who have. And from what I understand, in order to purify the silver, they would uh, get all the silver in this big pot that, that could withstand ridiculous temperatures. And they would get the silver to melt, and then they would continue to add more heat. And then impurities would begin to surface up to the top. And they would have a tool that they could run across the top of that silver to scrape out all the impurities. And then they would add more heat, more impurities would come up, and they would scrape and continue the process until no more impurities were arising. And after they believed that all the impurities were out, the refiner would look down into the, into the container of the silver. And if he could see his reflection in the silver, then he knew that it was pure, and they would stop the process. Now, keeping that in mind, I want you to picture God as the Bible describes him as a refiner and a purifier of silver, sitting over his people, scraping away all of those impurities, every bit of it, until he can see himself in you and in me. We want to show Jesus to the world. We need to live a pure life. Thirdly and finally tonight, if I want to show Jesus to the world, I believe one of the most powerful ways that we can do that is by changing our own lives, by modeling repentance, if you will, showing the world that it's not just lip service, but that we, we truly believe what it is that we're saying. In, in Matthew chapter 16, we find that Jesus He's moving about from place to place. And as he's moving about from place to place, he stops and he asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? He was asking them, I want you to tell me who, who the crowds of people, who do they say that I am? And they began to answer him with a variety of answers. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And so on and so on. And then Jesus asked him another question. He says, but who do you say that I am? So he narrowed it down. I'm not just asking you, who does the world think that I am, but who do you think that I am? And Peter answered that he believed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was right there when Jesus made that statement that on that rock he would build his church. Jesus understood that his disciples needed to really grasp who he was, that he wasn't just another good man, that he was the Son of God, that he was the one that they needed to allow to transform their life. They couldn't be the same after spending time with him. If you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 5. We'll close with this passage. Mark chapter 5. It's one of my favorite biblical accounts to look at when we're talking about a, an extreme change in any individual. We find the story here of, uh, of a demon-possessed man. To my knowledge, we don't know his name. We know that the demons that were inside of him revealed themselves as legion, for they were many. He had a lot of demons, a lot of trouble in that regard. Uh, the, the city uh, surrounding where this man was dwelling had cast him out. Many times they had tried to bind him with chains, but it says he was so strong he would snap those chains. He would cut himself with rocks and cry out in the night. He was someone, it's safe to say, you wouldn't let your, uh, let your children go and hang out with. He was a scary individual. He was someone that had a lot of people terrified. And then one day he met Jesus. He met the one that could actually change his life when no one else could. And he cast those demons out of this man. And the Bible says that he was found later clothed and in his right mind. And as he began reflecting back on all of those horrible uh, nights that he spent dealing with those demons that nobody could get rid of, but only Jesus could, naturally he wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus wouldn't allow it. Let's look at the end of the story in Mark chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. It says, And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Verse 20, 
It says, And he went away and began to proclaim in all of Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. Pay real close attention to these last words. And everyone marveled. I want you to reflect for just a moment with me tonight as we conclude. Why did everyone marvel when this man came and preached? Sadly, I don't believe it's because he walked to the city and he began to tell them about Jesus. Because, you see, people before this man came and spoke about Jesus. People after this man came and spoke about Jesus. They didn't always receive the same reaction that this formerly demon-possessed man had. I would submit to you that everyone stood in awe, if you would, that everyone marveled at this man's preaching, not because of the words that he said, but because they knew that that was the man that we threw out of the city. That was the man that was cutting himself with rocks. That was the man that was snapping every chain we tried to restrain him with, and now here he is, calm, in his right mind, and talking to us about Jesus Christ. They saw a radical change that could only come from God, and they were in awe. I want to ask a simple question as we conclude tonight. I want us to ask ourselves this question. How have I changed since I became a Christian? How have I really changed from the moment that I made that decision that I wanted to become a Christian? What changed in my life? Have I changed relationships that I had? Have I changed the, co the consumption that I was used to of media? Do I treat my body differently? Do, have my activities varied? Has my, has my priorities changed? Am I the same person I was then? Or have I modeled repentance before the world? Have I changed my life? How do we show the world, Jesus? I would submit to you that we could give many, many answers, but we can start by talking about Jesus. We can stand out by living a pure life. And we can show someone an example. We can give people an example they can relate to and cling to as we're bringing them to Christ by changing our own life, admitting our own wrongs and following Jesus as our Savior. Tonight, we want to offer the invitation. It's not mine. It's the Lord's invitation. Maybe there's someone here tonight that has never made that commitment to follow Him, never been baptized to have your sins washed away so that you can begin a new life in Christ. If you're here tonight and that describes your situation, we'd invite you to come. Maybe there's someone else here tonight that you have made that commitment, but you realize that you're not bringing others to Jesus. You're not bringing Jesus to the world, and you need prayers for strength. We're also here to help you with that tonight. We'd invite you to come if you have any spiritual need tonight as we stand and we sing this song.